All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Um, on behalf of TRI and our partners, Metro South, Marta Research, the University of Queensland, Queensland University of Technology, welcome to the inaugural LINK showcase. My name's Helen Benham. Um, I'm the Director of Clinical Translation here at the TRI, and I'll be your MC for this evening. I'd like to start this afternoon by acknowledging and paying my respects to both the Jagera people and the Turrbal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we are gathered today. I would like to pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. I do have a couple of housekeeping measures which are mandatory, particularly in COVID times. We need to try and maintain social distancing. When leaving, you need to sanitise on the way out of a venue. If you're sick, you shouldn't be here, um, but you should uh, contact TRI. When leaving, we require you to exit through the main entrance at the top of the stairs. The toilets are located in the TRI building by the main walkway next to reception. So, at TRI, we recognise the importance of multidisciplinary, multi-institutional collaborations for medical research. And that's the way to successfully translate to patient care. Clinician and researcher partnerships are absolutely integral to this process. And TRI is uniquely situated here on the Princess Alexandra campus and also through our partnership with MARTA Health and Metro South Health to foster clinician and researcher collaborations. So the LINK showcase really marks the launch of the new LINK or the leading innovation through new collaborations. And this is also, as well as a showcase tonight, is of course a grant scheme. And it's the first step we think in, value, in, in nurturing these valuable um, uh, partnerships. And in doing so, TRI is partnering with Metro South and MARTA Research to offer eight grants of up to $50,000 for new research collaborations for early to mid-career researchers and uh, sorry, researchers at TRI and clinicians based at either Metro South Health or MARTA um, Health. Today, we'll hear from four clinicians and four researchers about their projects, their clinical dilemmas, and the research projects that they really need some clinical input or collaboration on. We'll also hear from four groups who have already successfully collaborated together with clinician and researcher partnerships. So to start us off, I'd just like to ask um, Professor John Upham, who's the Chair of Research at Metro South, to say a couple of words. So thank you, Helen, and it's uh, really exciting to see this event um, coming to place, act actually happening, and exciting to see uh, those of you that have been able to join us in, in the auditorium today. Um, there is already a lot of really good quality uh, collaborative research happening between clinicians uh, in, in the hospital and uh, researchers within the building, but there is clearly a great opportunity for much more to happen. Uh, and and uh, putting on uh, events like uh, this, this symposium right now and uh, the associated LINK program is a really important step in, uh, in facilitating the development of new collaborations. Uh, we recognise the great value uh, that's been obtained from the collaborations that are happening already, but this program is really looking at, at, at facilitating uh, and developing uh, new collaborations uh, groups of people that have not worked together in the past, but have come together around a clinical problem, a, an issue that needs to be addressed, a basic science discovery that needs to be translated uh, into clinical care. And, and for that reason, I'm particularly excited about, at, about this opportunity. Um, when this building was first constructed and, and opened uh, many years ago, there was a little bit of reluctance on the part of people working in the hospital and thinking, oh, what's this building across the road? What is it? Is it a research hotel? Uh, how does it relate to my kind of work? One of the most important steps in getting people to cross the gulf uh, in terms of the road that runs between TRI and the hospital, of course, was opening the Catalyst coffee shop. And people realised soon thereafter that um, this is a pretty interesting place to be. But uh, for many clinicians in the hospital, the coffee shop's perhaps as far as they've got. And what we'd like to see people doing now is making that next step and engaging uh, with the researchers and vice versa, so that we can see some really exciting uh, new and innovative projects uh, develop 
uh, to uh, the benefit of the science that happens on this campus and to the benefit of the uh, patients that come to our facility and the wider community. So uh, thank you very much, Helen, and it's exciting to see this uh, uh, happening uh, today. Thanks, John. I was also going to invite um, Professor Meher Gandhi, if he was here on behalf of Marta. Meher, did you want to say a few words? Sorry, you've caught me by surprise because I wasn't expecting to be asked to, to speak, but uh, just to say we're very supportive of the, uh, the whole concept. It's good to see a good turnout. I, I'm assuming we've also got people online. Um, I, I think that a, a good, um, these are relatively small grants, but I think the important thing is it's a starting point. It's a milestone. And some of the most amazing things that came out of came out from these baby steps. So I think this is a really important initiative and just like to I hope that it grows and um, please stay to the end so that uh, you can have those important conversations um, to try and uh, get those ideas going. Thank you. Okay, so let's get going. So um, how do research and clinicians go about forming successful collaborations? Well, to share her insights, um, I'd like to welcome Associate Professor Fiona Simpson and her collaborator. I'll do the introduction. Yes. Yep, you've got your mic on. <laughs> yeah. Good way. I think the same people see each other. Yeah, we'll get a bit for it. That's better. We just need to stay Across further away. Social distancing. Yeah. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Fiona Simpson. I'm a scientist. I'm a complete nerd. I was the kid that spent all of lunchtime playing Dungeons and Dragons in the science labs, and I'm very proud of being a nerd. This is Dr. Emma Carlson. She's a PHO in general surgery under Chris Pike at The Matter. And we are collaborators. So, one of the reasons I presume I was invited to talk today is um, Sorry, when I... Sorry, Fiona, do you want to take your mask off? You are appropriately... I forget I've got it on these I days. <laughs> so one of the reasons I expect that I was invited to talk today is that we collaborate a lot with the clinicians at the hospital. Um, we have five minutes, but just briefly, I collaborated with Professors Peter Sawyer, Sandra Perchedo, Matt Foote, um, all of pathology, um, so Duncan Lambie, Caroline Cooper, um, where else? We've got Ben Panitza and the whole head and neck ENT, um, team. Chris Pike, the HPB team at the PA. Yeah, um, Ewan Walpole, who's actually the lead on the two clinical trials that we put through. Um, basically, I'm a complete tart wandering around the hospital <laughs> and I have no problem with it whatsoever. And it's really surprising to me that we have to encourage this here or that there's any hesitation at all. So my PhD training was at Cambridge, Addenbrooke's Hospital, which is one of the world's most successful medical teaching hospitals. The reason being is that they're completely integrated with the scientists. In fact, the clinicians there fight to get places to work with the scientists. I then did my postdoctoral studies as a welcome fellow at the Scripps in La Jolla in the USA, which is attached to Scripps Memorial. And we had the same thing there. We only let certain clinicians through the door. They had to prove themselves before they got in the door of the Scripps Research Institute, but that's what made them exceptionally successful in their careers. So the collaboration between science and medicine is age old. And one of the things we have to be aware of at the moment, and perhaps leading into the hesitancy, especially in Brisbane and Queensland, is that science is under attack. We're back proving that the earth is round to people using satellite phones to discuss the fact that the earth is flat. Okay, and we're trying to convince people that the Viagra shot for COVID is much better than using the Viagra blue pill to treat COVID. I mean, okay, so there is some hesitancy. So instead of talking about our research today, about my research and collaborations, it resulted in a cell paper. Go read the cell paper. Ewan Walpole's really happy having a cell paper, okay? 
there's good things in collaboration. What we want to do is show you why clinicians and scientists should be working together, what the point is, and to remind you of a few things that you may have forgotten. There, there. Yep, yeah. I got them. You can just lift it off the top. Perfect. I've made it easy for you. My supervisor is <laughs> still looking after me today. <laughs> so, Associate Professor Simpson, what do you think you can do about diabetes for patients in the hospital? Well, that's a bit difficult. Um, we'll have a look to see what it is that they're missing. Mm -hmm. And then we have to find it. And then we have to synthesize it. We've produced it. Here you go. Thank you. You're welcome. So, you know, after we've done our operation, you know, the knee may become infected, become mm. a bit septic. What do you think you can do about that one? Oh, that kills a lot of people. Um, we're going to have an accident. It's going to be a complete nerd accident in a petri dish with some bread. Here you go. Here's some antibiotics. <laughs> I may need some more. Oh, Especially we'll we'll try pads. and find some new... There's people like Amateur Blumenthal and things in the building. They're trying to find replacements for, for these kinds of things. So what about... It's the 80s. All we need my to patients turn to the are... camera as well, apparently, with the cards. <laughs> <laughs> all my patients are passing away from this disease. I don't know what's happening with them. They've got no T cells. What's happening? I don't know. I was um, watching this because I'm currently an undergraduate student in Edinburgh and San Francisco and Edinburgh, the capitals of the planet for people dropping dead like this. And I'm an undergraduate and we've all been told to stop having sex and it's really bad. We've just discovered this. It's a virus that's causing all those people to die. Wear condoms. Thank you, scientists. I know that this is what it is now, but I need you to help me to fix it. Mm -hmm. That's really hard because, you know, the HIV itself, but then it turns to full-blown AIDS and, and people die. Until we find a complete clearance, we can give you these. It might suppress it for a while and stop them at least dying. I'll take it. Thanks. So... <laughs> I'd really like to take out my patient's gallbladder, but they won't hold still long enough for me to do it. <laughs> we had to add this because the first one is chloroform. And the reason I first added chloroform is because its inventor was a Scottish person called Sir James Young Simpson, I presume an ancestor. <laughs> Here you go. Anything better than the chloroform? Well, I've got one here, I should warn you, the people that use it, um, they're gonna end up having a tendency to suicide. And I'm informed they need to be able to play Sudoku really well, <laughs> but it's anesthesia. Hmm, this is a tricky one. I don't know if you can help me out. My patients are dying from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, that's a really difficult one. And I really, really want to help you with that because my brother-in-law has it. In fact, when he was diagnosed, he had 72 nodes above and below the diaphragm. That was about 10 years ago. The first thing science produced for that is our CHOP, a combination of chemotherapies. You know, our CHOP is all well and good, but what happens when it doesn't work? Well... As with our family, after five years, he did get a recurrence. The reason he's still here with my nieces and my sister is science came up with autologous stem cell transplants. And that's five years molecularly clear of non-Hodgkin's. That's a good one. I like that one. <laughs> Getting heavy. Oh, why can't I get married this year? <laughs> and why can't I go to a music festival? Please sort this out. <laughs> um, yeah, COVID-19, it does exist for those people who've decided they don't believe in viruses. Um, this is really difficult in any, any past year. If this had happened in any year prior to now, we probably couldn't have helped you. But in this absolute current time of science, we've been fortunate enough to have mRNA vaccines. I will happily take that. Thank you. But wait, 
This is a new technology because they threw, threw tons of money at research, which is unheard of because usually we're like scabby beggars singing for our supper at everybody's door. But now that we've got these mRNA vaccines, you gave me a problem so many years ago and we couldn't really solve it, but so many people die of it. But mRNA vaccines are now a possibility for malaria. And remember that problem that killed my sex life in Edinburgh? <laughs> the mRNA vaccines might also work for HIV. Thank you. A different kind of lockdown. <laughs> so keep coming. Well, since this is the PA, what do I do about my patients in melanoma clinic? Yeah, I did notice that Australians tend to go down the beach, cover themselves in coconut oil and fry themselves. Um, melanoma is obviously a real problem in Queensland. So to start with, we can give you BRAF inhibitors. So they inhibit the MEK, AKT, ERK kinase pathway. See how you go with that. I don't love it though. My patients get deranged liver functions. Their melanoma comes back. Is there anything better you can do in your bag of tricks? Over liver there? function issues. Okay, <laughs> that's not good. Oh, okay. That one needs something really, really different. Yeah, so the science fight to get this one through in the face of all the drug companies and all the scientists telling these people that it could never be done in humans. But now we give you the checkpoint inhibitors, anti-PD-1, anti-PDL-1. I'll happily take that. <laughs> oh, this is getting heavy. Oh, one that's very close to our heart here. Can you do anything about cervical cancer, TRI? Well, I can. <laughs> And I really wanted to be able to go into the audience tonight and ask a scientist who could, but he's at another research thing at the, the, um, the UQ um, centre down by the river, what's it called? Customs House. Because I really wanted to ask Ian Fraser to give me this card, Gardasil vaccine. There you go. Thank you. And finally, what brings Fiona and I together is pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So we were already working on a breast cancer project when I found that I was very sad going to HPV clinic every Thursday. All of our patients have really poor prognoses. They present way too late with invasive cancers and sometimes we can't operate, which is you know, what I enjoy to do. So that's what we're working on. So Emma came into our laboratory as a PhD student working on our breast cancer projects, but as a surgeon, PDAC or pancreatic adenocarcinoma is a real problem for her. Um, across globally, I think the five year survival rates are 9.8%. And I think recently the clinical fraternity here lost one of their own to PDAC. So we've left it as a discussion. What we've discovered is John Hooper in the building has an antibody therapy that he started for ovarian cancer and, um, and breast cancer. It turns out it works quite well in PDAC models. But at the moment, John's stuck because we need to go to clinical trial. It needs about $5 million to manufacture the antibody into the clinical version so that we can put it into the patients. So in the meantime, 9.8% survival is a problem. Um, why is it 9.8? Is it because you catch it? Well, it's because we catch it too late. You know, by the time patients present with pancreatic cancer, they've got invasive disease. What we need to do is catch it early in stage 1B, you know, when the survival is 70%. So that's what we're going to try and work on. So if you can diagnose PDAC patients at stage 1B, instead of the late stages that present to you, you can surgeon them. Yep. I'd and like to do your percent outcomes are 60, 70 percent then. So really, in talking to the clinicians, the problem is not just producing a therapy for late stage. It's really early detection. Um, so we should stop being here and you and I should get back to the lab and work that out. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So I'd like to uh, invite our next exemplar, who is Professor Rick Thompson. Rick is joining us by Zoom, as unfortunately COVID has left him stranded in northern New South Wales. Rick, welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yep, yep. Excellent. And I'll just share 
Uh, okay. Is that working? Because it said something about another participant sharing. Uh, you should be able to share now. Okay. Okay, that's got it. Can you see it? Yep, we can see it. Okay, so thank you. What a hard act to follow. Fantastic. Thank you, Fiona and Emma. And uh, well, mine is going to be very boring after that, but I am very delighted to give you a few minutes of update on our Center for Personalized Analysis of Cancer. And uh, Fiona is part of that. This is a uh, BDHP MRFF uh, administered uh, program for rapid and replied research translation. Uh, with an emphasis on clinician researcher training and consumer in involvement. Um, oops, that's right, I have to use that. And so um, this is what we do. This is essentially the schematic taken from one of our tumor streams. We are working, this is personalized medicine, looking to take pieces of tumor tissue from patients in a number of different streams, which were already established, and we've essentially brought them together as illustrated here for bladder cancer, take it out of formalin, but in nice healthy media to the lab and either produce uh, organoids, three-dimensional organoids in floating cell cultures or very thin tissue slices called explants. And these have both been uh, proven uh, in recent times to be very representative of the tissue still in the patient. Obviously it's not perfect, but amongst the various options such as PDXs, 2D cell cultures, et cetera, these have become the, the uh, instruments of choice for doing studies to ask, what is that person going to best respond to? What is gonna be the right drug for them? We work very closely with uh, the genomics group, the ATGC led by Paul Leo, and hopefully we would be in a position eventually to triage genomic leads for, exper for personalized therapies coming from individuals. And this is something that uh, is our, uh, one of our ambitions. So CPAC actually came from a, an equipment application uh, that Elizabeth Williams will talk later and, and myself put to the ACRF when we recruited a number of people that also had an interest in this kind of technology and these kind of approaches, working for, between research and clinician partnerships to get this biosorta. This was an, an instrument that we're still keen to get from the ACRF, which allows us to take organoids and sort them based on size and content so we could do uniform drug studies on them. We didn't get that grant, uh, but we were in a good position then to apply to the BDHP. And I'm in a way, sorry for this slide, but in a way, make no apologies. It's a huge consortium, a group of over 60 investigators that came together in these 12 different, or 11 at the time, but now 12 different tumor streams. You can see that they're basically right across Brisbane with institutions uh, through to the Royal Brisbane, QIMR, MARTA, TRI, uh, and and also we extended to get expertise because there's groups in other parts of the country doing this to Melbourne through the VCCC and Peter Mac. So you can see that uh, the institutions are colored coded. So this is quite a broad collaboration across people from all different institutions. Clinicians are bolded. You can see that there's clinicians in every team as there must be. And they're the ones that are providing those tissues and telling us what, uh, and providing those patients. Uh, and so, also, you can see that some uh, streams are led by other in institutions. So the brain group is, is headed out of QIMR and Royal Brisbane. Um, the, the endometrial and the OBGYN is primarily MARTA. And then others are quite a big collection in melanoma. You can see lots of colors, breast, et cetera, and skin. And so there's ticks in some of these boxes. And as I mentioned, one of the key criteria uh, for that MRFF was clinician researcher training. And so we've tried to nestle uh, tr clinician trainees into these programs. We have 16 clinical research training fellowships of which we've placed seven already, and we're looking to place nine more. So if you're a clinician and this sounds interesting to you and you're interested in any or all of these cancers, please let us know. We also have a genomic stream led by uh, Paul Leo from the ATGC and an immunology stream. I forgot to mention that those 
uh, formats are amenable to co-culture with immune cells and increasingly they're being involved in, included uh, and utilized to do immunotherapy types of testing as well. So um, I just also, sorry that I, Elizabeth and I aren't able to be with you. We're stuck in New South Wales where we love living, but we're a bit stuck in terms of getting to Queensland. But if you have any questions and any interest, please contact us by email. Uh, certainly we're interested too in the link showcase scheme. What a fantastic scheme. Uh, talking about small steps, there's a lot of small steps here. It was a good grant, uh, over a million dollars, just over a million dollars. But as you can see, spreading it this far, we're just putting the icing on the cake of, of work that was already being going on, already established in those groups with clinician researcher partnerships. It's scalable in the sense that anyone can join these streams. If you're interested and you're not there yet, please come and tell us. And in fact, renal wasn't in the initial submission by, uh, by chance, but we've added them and we could add others as well. So I'll leave it there. I know we have a bit of pressure of time and thank you for, again for the opportunity to present CPAC and thank you so much for all the people who've helped make this happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. It's just such an amazing example of the sort of collaboration that you can begin and build on. Um, and if you would like to collaborate with Rick, you'll find his contact details in the program. And also actually you'll find lots of detail of all of the people who are presenting tonight or who did put an expression of an interest. And if you can't get together today, then please contact people through that program. So we're now gonna hear from our eight presenters. They're each allocated 10 minutes. I'm gonna be a little bit hard with the time. So I'll approach you when you're reaching seven to eight minutes to allow for a couple of minutes of questions. For those in the audience that would like to ask a question, please raise your hand and someone will come around with a microphone. So our first speaker is um, Stacey Bartlett, who's going to talk about harnessing oxidized cholesterols to improve COVID-19 outcomes. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge my team, our group, the Infectious Immunity and Metabolism Group, led by Associate Professor Katerina Renaka, our PhD students, Dr. Min and Cheng, Associate Professor Lucy Burr, Director of Respiratory Cystic Fibrosis and Sleep Medicine at the Mater Hospital, and Dr. Kirsty Short and Dr. Helle belfort Oman from the University of Queensland. I'd also like to thank our funders, the NIH, MATA Foundation, the Australian Respiratory Council, and the Australian Infectious Diseases Research Center. Respiratory viruses affect us throughout our lives from infancy to old age, causing a range of illness from a common cold to severe pneumonia. Progression to severe disease is generally in three different phases, an asymptomatic phase, a non-severe symptomatic phase, and the hyperinflammation phase. We work on different respiratory infections in our lab, including influenza, RSV, and COVID-19. The underlying mechanisms of why some individuals develop severe disease while others have mild or no symptoms remains unknown. Oxidized cholesterols and metabolites of cholesterol and play an important role in regulating immune function. We have recently shown that the enzymes which produce these oxysterols are upregulated in the lung upon bacterial and viral infections and are associated with disease severity. In a preclinical model, we have shown that oxidized cholesterols mediate the recruitment of immune cells to the lung and regulate inflammation. In a mouse model of diabetes, oxysterol uh, oxysterol production is dysregulated by the high fat diet, resulting in further exacerbated inflammation, which is associated with more severe disease. Our next step is to investigate this in humans with and without respiratory infections and with and without diabetes. So we are seeking clinicians with access to fresh bronchiolegola lavage samples and blood samples from individuals with viral or bacterial respiratory tract infections. We also have a key focus on diabetes as diabetes patients are at an increased risk of viral respiratory infections. 
We are interested in investigating if an elevated oxidized cholesterol concentration in the lung is associated with an increase in immune cell infiltration, increased inflammation, and more severe disease. And are these oxidized cholesterols in the lung different between diabetes patients and healthy controls? And is their production affected by cholesterol lowering drugs? So when a virus enters the respiratory tract, oxidized cholesterols and cytokines are produced and attract immune cells to the site of infection. While attraction of immune cells and production of inflammatory cytokines is important for controlling viral replication and spread, an exacerbated inflammatory response or cytokine storm occurs when there is an excessive infiltration of pro-inflammatory immune cells into the lung, which in turn triggers pathology and results in severe clinical manifestations. In our preclinical model, we have evaluated a drug that blocks the effects of these oxidized cholesterols on immune cells, specifically preventing the migration of the immune cells contributing to the cytokine storm. This, res this approach results in lower inflammation without negatively affecting the antiviral response. So we believe that this project will deliver a novel host-directed therapy, which can rapidly be, be translated into the clinic and used alongside approved antivirals to improve better patient outcomes. We anticipate that this form of therapy will be applicable to a wide range of viral and bacterial respiratory infections. Thank you. Thanks. Um, people have some questions for Stacey. Just over there, Amanda. Thank you. A very interesting presentation. Um, do these um, cholesterols exist and can be repurposed? Do they are they a therapeutic indication for something? Or will you have to go through the various clinical trials before? So there, are, there is a lot of different types of oxysterols. So initially we'd have to kind of, we have a focus on one specific type, um, but I'm sure the all the others, there is different things. So I'm not too sure on all of them, sorry. <laughs> Stacey, I've got a question. What will this collaboration look like? So tell me, who you want, who you're going out to see, what are you going to say to them when the person in the audience comes up to you and says, actually, Stacey, I'm keen to collaborate? So yeah, we're really interested in getting respiratory uh, infection samples. So if you have any, um, we are particularly interested in COVID-19. Um, we've set up a preclinical model of the COVID infection in mouse, um, which we're trialing our, our drug in at the moment. Um, but going forward with a collaboration, uh, yeah, it would be kind of getting samples and then potentially uh, testing to see the different levels of oxysterols in uh, in these samples about fluid and to see where we can take our drug treatment from there. Other questions? Thanks, Stacey. Coffee. Thank you. I'd like to invite um, Princess Alexandra Hospital staff specialist, Dr. David Hyten, to present to us. And he's going to talk about individualizing perioperative blood pressure to prevent secondary end organ dysfunction. And I think you're right there. Thanks. Can you hear me? Um, I'm sorry, Professor Simpson, that it's not on Sudoku and uh, suicide. Um, although the perioperative period is very dangerous, uh, so perioperative organ dysfunction is a major source of morbidity and mortality. And in fact, if you categorise that as one disease, it would be the third leading cause of death internationally. So it's a major problem. Intraoperative hypotension occurs very frequently. In fact, we've just finished this study in across the NHS, 250 hospitals, and found that in elder patients, the instance of important hypotension was possibly in excess of 80%, depending on the definition used. And this has been implicated in major organ dysfunction. In fact, in observational studies, prospectively looking at major surgery, uh, myocardial injury defined by high sensitivity, troponin, renal injury, and stroke defined by MRI has an instance around about five to 10%. Uh, and it's really just been through the development of biomarkers and the application in the perioperative period that we've been able to find this. Um, until last year, we had no idea that around about 7% of our patients aged greater than 65 
are having silent brain infarction after surgery. And this impacts cognitive performance at a year. So there's a major problem here. And really the only way that we've uncovered it is through collaboration with basic, basic science, particularly looking at biomarkers. We've been involved in international and local ongoing clinical trials investigating defending blood pressure uh, to try and find out how this intersects with this problem, whether preventing hypotension or optimizing blood pressure could improve outcome in organ dysfunction. However, a simple measure of blood pressure is clearly an oversimplification of the problem. We can look directly at organs, and this is what we've been particularly interested in. We can measure processes in the brain using non-invasive optical techniques. We're particularly interested in cerebral autoregulation, which is the process uh, that maintains constant cerebral blood flow. So by looking at the brain, we can actually identify which blood pressure is too high or too low. And perhaps this gives us a way to individualize blood pressure or hemodynamics in individual patients, not just for the brain, but for the entire body. We use an, a non-invasive optical technique called near-infrared spectroscopy, which measures surrogates of cerebral blood flow. And this can be applied to the forehead and monitor the brain. And one of the, sorry, this hasn't turned out correctly. Um, one of the ways that we can look at this is by combining the blood pressure trace with the near infrared spectroscopy trace and tune in to the spontaneous oscillations in that. And on the left there is an example of uh, impaired autoregulation and on the right um, intact. And you can see we can make this plot which predicts uh, the optimal blood pressure. And one of the innovations that we've applied is translating this from the intensive care uh, environment using an, some novel signal processing into the anesthetic environment. So we're presently doing two studies, uh, two different paradigms of this work, looking at the effect of modifying uh, whether the patients take the ACE inhibitors or uh, hold them preoperatively and the effect on or hypotension and organ perfusion, and also looking in a the clot retrieval for stroke because the type of anesthetic propofol or sevofluorine mediates cerebral hemodynamics and blood pressure. So these are two paradigms that we're looking at the moment, but we've got great interest to translate this paradigm actually into a treatment modality. So it is possible to prospectively predict what hemodynamics might optimally perform, uh, perfuse organs. And we're particularly interested in renal injury and brain injury, particularly with this high incidence that's only just been discovered of silent brain infarction and particularly with our expertise locally in renal transplantation, we think these would be two very useful uh, applications of this physiology. Uh, so we're seeking collaborators, particularly looking at biomarkers in these regions. Um, there's a lot of uh, biomarkers for brain injury, but none have shown to be particularly uh, successful. There's a lot of interest in neuroimaging. So someone interested in brain biomarkers or some renal team, uh, particularly renal transplantation, looking at a range of different biomarkers for renal injury, uh, particularly in the high risk situation of renal transplantation. And these initial pilot steps would be necessary and quite beneficial to refine this technique and take it through to large clinical trials. Our brain, our stroke, as a trial has actually been endorsed by the ANSCAR CTN. So we're hoping to take that forward into a large multi-center trial in the near future. Thanks. Question. Um, um, so um, it's quite a complex issue and you can't really go over it during a presentation like this, but it's not clear whether the primary issue is the blood pressure or the blood pressure is just a manifestation of patient frailty and autonomic dysfunction. We can measure um, tissue metabolism, and I didn't go into this, but my PhD was actually using near infrared spectroscopy for a different reason, measuring cytochrome C oxidase in the brain. So you can actually measure the activity of complex four in the mitochondrial respiratory chain. And we have unfortunately stuck in Sydney at the moment, but a machine, a research machine coming through that we're going to do some studies on that. So we can measure 
uh, directly measure metabolism and the effect of the hypotension on that. There are a few situations where it's very clear that that is the case. And something like renal transplantation is a good model of that. Uh, but it is, it's not totally clear whether uh, hypotension is directly related to tissue ischemia and other forms of injury. So that is one of the things that we're hoping to actually elucidate by using this. Okay, the biomarkers are a biomarker, a biomarker, a biomarker. Yeah. So for the audience and for the scientists that might be here, where do you think the biomarkers come in from? Physiologically and anatomically? So where, where can the collaborators help you? Um, so we're particularly interested in anyone who's into neuroimaging. I think that is some of the lowest hanging fruit there. There's been a large, um, people have looked at trying to identify any link between perioperative hypotension and brain injury, but we've just not been equipped with the right tools to identify it. As just this one study uh, that in a thousand patients where they've done MRI, MRI and um, identified that about 7% of patients are actually uh, having a silent stroke. So I, I think that you're right, there have been a lot of biomarkers tested in this area, but I think particularly neuroimaging has, uh, there's a lot of low hanging fruit there, it just hasn't really been investigated at all. And we really have to do this justice because it's a very large health problem. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Kavita Bisht, from, who's a research officer in the Stem Cell Biology Group with Mata Research, um, to give us a talk on identifying mechanism and new therapies to treat anemia of inflammation and inflammatory bowel disease. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, I would like to thank you, Chiara, for giving me this opportunity to present my research idea, which is to identify mechanism and new um, therapies to treat anemia of inflammation and inflammatory bowel disease. First of all, I would like to thank my supervisor, John Pierlevec, and um, our collaborator, Ingrid Winkler, and uh, people from inflammatory bowel disease, Associate Professor Jacob Bigan, Professor Mera Hasnan, and Dr. Ren Wang. So anemia happens when your body doesn't make enough red blood cells, and this leads to low hemoglobin, impaired transport of oxygen from lungs to other organs, and shortness of breath, and many other symptoms. And uh, due to a lack of oxygen, because of low hemoglobin, we can also get multiple organ failure. And this can cause, sorry, this can cause an early death if anemia gets severe. And this is the data from 2010, where 68 million people were recorded to be living currently with the disability, which was caused by anemia. So what causes anemia? So there are some factors, including parasites, such as malaria, genetic mutations, sickle cell anemia, and thalassemia, intestinal bleeding, iron deficiency, or anemia can be caused by infections, including tuberculosis, sepsis, salmonella, or it's also observed in chronic diseases, such as inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and autoimmune diseases. Anemia caused by infections and chronic diseases is called anemia of inflammation, or AI. And I'm interested in studying anemia of inflammation because it is the second most common anemia after iron deficiency. And it affects currently 400 million people. And the current treatment include transfusion with red blood cell or iron or hormone supplements. However, 50% anemic patients with IBD do not respond to these current treatments. Therefore, a, we need to better understand the mechanisms of anemia of inflammation so we can discover better treatments for these patients. So to understand anemia of inflammation, our group first developed a preclinical model of infection and we published these uh, results last year. And if you want to know more about this uh, study, please, look at my paper and I'm going to show you some of the findings. Uh, before I show you, I just want to show you the schematic how erythropoiesis or formation of red blood cells occur in the bone marrow. So our hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow makes red blood cell progenitors called erythroblasts. These erythroblasts then make 
forms reticulocytes, which is immature red blood cells, which then mature into red blood cells or erythrocytes, which are then released into blood. Our body makes 3 million red blood cells per second. And while I'm talking to you, my body is ma busy making red blood cells. And when we make less than 3 million blood red blood cells, we get anemic. And the formation of red blood cells also require a crucial immune cells called erythroblastic island macrophage because the central macrophage and because all these erythroblasts and red blood cells form an island around a central macrophage and these EBI macrophage acts as a nurse cells for red blood cells because if the, uh, this macrophage provide them nutrients, growth factors, iron for hemoglobin, and they're also important for enucleation of erythroblasts to red blood cells. So we uh, developed a model of infection using lipopo uh, lipopolysaccharide or LPS, which is found in the wall of gram-negative bacteria. And the first thing we noticed when we collected the bone marrow, um, the uh, discoloration of bone marrow after LPS, which is clearly indicating that bone erythropoiesis is suppressed. So we quantified the number of erythroblasts, reticulocytes, and erythrocytes. And we found that LPS completely suppressed the number of erythroblasts, reticulocytes, and erythrocytes in the bone marrow. Then we looked what happens uh, in the erythroblastic island. So we use, um, a technique called Im imaging flow cytometry, where you can combine microscopy with flow cytometry. So in a saline treated, um, I don't know if I can look this. Oh, sorry, sorry. Is that working? Uh, yep. So in a saline treated macrophage, you can see here in the center, there is a green macrophage, uh, which is F4 AD positive, surrounded by HAG, CD17, Turbine 9 positive erythroblasts, and also red blood cells. But when you have LPS, um, there is macrophage is still there, but there is no erythroblast or red blood cells forming an island. So this island falls apart. And the numbers of these erythroblastic islands were completely gone after LPS. So now I now want to apply my findings with LPS to IBD because um, the gut lining of IBD is inflamed and causes fever, pain, and many other symptoms. And on top of that, 30% of these IBD patients are anemic and they live with poor health, chronic fatigue and poor physical state. And 50% of these IBD anemic patients do not respond to iron supplementation or erythropoietin supplementation or red blood cell transfusion. And they can also have heart failure if it's left untreated. So to first see if anemia occurs in IBD, I developed, a, uh, I'm just showing you preclinical data. I developed a, a mouse model where uh, I gave mouse 3% dextran sodium sulfate in the water for seven days and analyzed their bone marrow and um, blood. So DSS uh, causes, uh, is used, widely used to, for experimental colitis. And when we looked at the bone marrow, it was white after DSS. And the number of red blood cells were also down in the bone marrow and blood after DSS. So this uh, confirms that colitis induces anemia. So my hypothesis for this project is that molecules released by gut bacteria stays in healthy gut. However, in IBD, gut becomes leaky and causes these bacterial products to enter the blood, which leads to anemia. So I have three main aims for this project. So first name, I want to identify the key mechanisms and I'm going to use two clinically robust IBD mouse models. First will be experimental colitis, where I will give mouse um, DSS acute and chronic dose. Second, I'm going to use spontaneous colitis, which is Winnie mouse model. And this mouse, uh, medium mice were developed at Marcher, and they have mesense mutation in MAC2 gene, um, which is a gene um, uh, provide, protects from host defense. And these minimize um, develop spontaneous inflammation and closely resemble to human IBD phenotype. And then I want to test possible drugs for treating anemia of inflammation. So I will be testing drug which targets inflammation, uh, such as thioguanine and butosinide. And these two drugs are currently being used to treat IBD patients. Then I want to test a drug uh, which targets endotoxemia, including polymyxine and almethionine. And then I also want to try get antibody which targets interferon gamma because uh, studies shows that increased expression of interferon gamma um, suppresses erythropoiesis in the bone marrow in response to infection. 
and also increases degradation of red blood cells in the spleen. And then finally, I want to test some uh, samples from IV IBG patients and see if this anemia is associated with endotoxemia. So we do have an ongoing collaboration with Associate Professor Jake Bigun, who is a gastroenterologist at Martin. But I'm uh, looking for a gastroenterologist or hematologist, early career researcher who is interested in uh, understanding anemia inflammation in IBD to collaborate with me on this project. And with this, I would like to thank you, everyone. Thanks. So I guess the question again, while we wait for others is, what do you want from that hematologist or that gastroenterologist? So I'm, I'm just a basic biomedical researcher. Not just. Okay. <laughs> but I think the clinician will be important because they will help me understand the pathology. Like if gastroenterologist, like especially the IBD, um, no, I'm not expert in IBD. So I think, and also I want to get these IBD patient samples. And having a hematologist, if I can get, we also understand with the pathology of anemia because I only mm, I look at spleen or bone marrow, but it's beyond that. And I'm not that familiar with the pathology and just to identify, okay, this is anemia of inflammation, not any other sort of anemia. Mm -hmm. So I think that would help if the collaboration will help me. I'm only a boring old rheumatologist, but I can tell you that about two weeks ago, we had a patient um, come to clinic with terrible rheumatoid arthritis, new, explosive, horrible, and otherwise, could barely walk down the hallway. And one of the junior doctors came in to say to me, oh, Helen's terrible, terrible rheumatoid arthritis, and a, and a hemoglobin is 70. So as you know, you know, terrible anemia should be about 120 to 140. And um, the junior doctor said to me, I think, I think we better admit them to give them some blood transfusion and otherwise. Now they were hemodynamically okay. But in fact, it was an example of inflammatory driven, driven anemia. And over the course of a couple of weeks of using not the ideal treatment, but the one that we have that works the best, of course, which is corticosteroids using prednisone um, and then trying to chop off the inflammation. Another way we know how to in rheumatoid arthritis, which is cutting off anti-TNF. Yep. Um, so she came back to clinic on Monday and her hemoglobin's 106. She feels much better. But I guess my question to you is, is, is there a relationship? Can you think outside just IBD? You mentioned rheumatoid. Is endoxemia something I should be thinking about in my clinical practice? So, or? you know, this is uh, the future plan that um, if once I'm done with this project, that is our future plan. First, to translate to the human IBD patients. And then we will be looking in um, doing the uh, rheumatoid arthritis um, in setting, but uh, we don't have a model working live, but that is our future plan that we want do want to explore it and other chronic diseases, just not on IBD. Yeah. Questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Kavita. And next we'd like to welcome Dr. Tamer Matthias, who's a fellow with the orthopedic department at the Princess Alexandra Hospital. And he's gonna tell us about negative pressure Neurogenesis 2, stimulating and facilitating nerve axonal growth and regeneration after complete transaction injury using negative pressure phase two. I got through it. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present this research. Uh, so this is, we call this the negative pressure neurogenesis 2. Um, as we know, uh, as a background of this project, various modalities to facilitate nerve regeneration has been tried. This include nerve growth factors, neurotropic factors, and electrical uh, field gradient, nerve uh, guidance, conduit, mechanical stretching. All of these methods has been tried with very limited success. We know from wound therapy that negative pressure enhances and promote wound healing by both angiogenesis, macro and micro deformation. This includes multiple mechanisms. First is removal of excess interstitial fluid, minimize edema, decrease tissue bacterial loads and mechanical deformity of the cells, which result in increased cell production and increased matrix protein synthesis. We hypothesize that uh, negative pressure applied to the transected end of peripheral nerve would enhance nerve regeneration. This would reflect on the functional outcome. So this project is on live rats. Uh, we are going to create 
a gap of seven millimeter in the left sciatic nerve of the rat. And the two ends of the cut nerve will be inserted into a T-tube. And the that's through the transverse limb of the T-tube. The longitudinal limb of the T-tube will be tunneled under the skin of the rat and appears behind the rat's neck, through which negative pressure will be applied. And the aim is to translate this negative pressure to the ends of the transected nerve. In our previous phase, in phase one, we managed to conduct this uh, similar project and uh, applying with the negative pressure, we were able to monitor the pressure 24 seven and even having an app on the iPhone to ensure that the pressure is within plus or two millimeter mercury of the desired level. We have an ethical approval for the second stage to proceed with 30 whistle rats each three months. We are going to conduct the negative pressure for two weeks. After this, we are going to cut the tube behind the rat's neck to allow the rat to freely run within their cages for three months. The 30 rats will be divided into three groups. The control group, which will have no pressure. Group A will have negative 10 millimeter mercury pressure. Group B will have negative 20 millimeter mercury pressure. The aim of this research is to prove two things. First, prove the regeneration, which we have partially proved it in the first stage. This is by applying both gross measurement of the end of the nerve and microscopic and histological analysis on the end of the nerve. And secondary is to prove the functional outcome uh, at the three months mark. That will be through gait analysis, ladder run test, and withdrawal latency test to measure both uh, motor and sensory function of the recovering nerve. So we are aware that this is uh, a novel uh, research. There's no previous research completed on negative pressure to measure the functional outcome. So we have to start with small number of rats and to, that's to eliminate any possible harm and to monitor the efficacy. We anticipate that successful outcome from this study would lead to planning for future human clinical trials to address the unmet need to improve surgical approaches to repair peripheral nerve injuries. To conclude, this research has potential to improve outcome of nerve injury. We need help and co collaboration to provide, to pr sorry, to prove this concept and the hypothesis on the functional outcome. Possible area of collaboration are bioengineering or engineering uh, with a negative pressure system. Ideally, we are looking for an absorbable uh, material which can withstand the low negative pressure on the short and medium term and also pathology and tissue engineering um, ideas about how to uh, measure the outcome from pathological perspective can be looking for up and down regulated genes, um, gross factor introduced within the end of the nerve, um, also angiogenesis analysis and uh, cytoskeleton protein uh, arrangement changes. Thank you. audience is very quiet tonight. How will you do this in the human? In the human, it will be very similar to what we have done in the rat. So it will be through a tube, which is connected to an injured nerve and applying negative pressure, low negative pressure on the other end. So it's sort of allowing the nerve to grow within that conduit and stimulating the nerve to grow. The already present conduit in the market, the can allow the nerve to grow in a very short distance, but any long distance of the nerve, they don't like, they have very poor outcome in that. So I think with this, it's actually combining more than one mechanism to simulate nerve growth. Do you have some collaborators already involved? We have, I have collaborators in Griffith University uh -huh. and um, that's where the labs and the uh, surgery will be happening and measuring the functional outcome. So we're looking for collaborators for engineering perspective for the negative pressure system and uh, pathology as well. There's no Helen, one in... Uh, oh. Sorry, Helen, it's Rick. Oh, Rick, please go ahead. Uh, Except okay. I don't know how to get you on the screen. So just talk, we'll listen. I'll try just opening my video, that might do it. Anyway, a uh, lovely presentation and very interesting project. I just wondered, you know, the, um, you know, that I remember, uh, uh, research and uh, a focus on uh, extracellular matrix to, to promote nerve healing 
And I just wondered, is that something, what is it that you think the negative pressure will do to, in the tissue context that's going to promote that nerve healing? And would, would ECM extracellular matrix such as laminin be part of that? I mean, the answer, I don't know. So this is what we're trying to find out. We have conducted first stage and we found that the negative pressure actually regrow nerves and facilitate uh, regeneration. And we found the negative pressure, the low negative pressure worked much better than the high negative pressure. So minus 10 millimeter mercury grows the nerve much better than the 50 and the 70 negative uh, 50 and 70 millimeter mercury. So we just need to prove this on higher level with functional outcome and more pathology as well. So second question would be, do you envisage that there'd be things that you could add additionally to the model that might uh, synergize with the negative pressure? We think so, yeah. Negative pressure within that, and we will direct the nerve to okay. regrow and yeah. So I think there are multiple idea about measuring from cell perspective, which uh, looking for gene upregulation and downregulation and cytoskeleton as well. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. No one from Axis is here. I'm sure Michael Argos would love me to put me in, put him in this, but he might be somebody from a bioengineering his team point of view for you to have a chat to yeah. if you haven't already. Yeah, yeah we could connect you. Yeah, that would be great. Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right, thanks, um, Tamar. So next is Lisa Phillips, and Lisa's going to talk to us about elucidating the role of adipokine axis dysregulation in bone metastatic cancer to develop strategic new therapeutics. Thanks, Lisa. So thank you, Helen. Oops, how do we get out of this one? <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that little technical flaw. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to present today. So I'm a researcher, um, not clinician, and I'm really seeking someone to help me out in my question um, for bone metastatic cancer. So to give you a bit of an idea of who I am, so I'm an EMCR based here at the TRI, and so I head the Adipokine Research Group at the Australian Prostate Cancer Research Centre, Queensland. And so I've come on a bit of a journey through my career. Um, I originally was a, a researcher involved in um, early origins of adult health and disease and obesity, and then um, actually I had a bit of a uh, postdoc within a, a prostate cancer research lab. And so that's allowed me to combine my two interests, which is um, obesity and adipokines and prostate cancer. So we think of adipocytes as just a fat store, but they're not. They actually secrete a large um, array of adipokines and cytokines. And so we can see here from leptin, which is mutated in, the, in these mice, um, we can see that just a change in the leptin gene results in this huge obese phenotype in these animals. And so we know that there's a lot of signaling pathways involved downstream of adipokines. They are hormones. Um, and so I've been working um, most recently um, in lungs. Um, so I have an advanced Queensland fellowship um, to explore this area of interest but also in prostate cancer. And so we have multiple um, fundings through um, Movember, US Department of Defense and those kinds of things to really explore the role of adipokines in prostate cancer. And you might be thinking why adipokines in prostate cancer? Well, circulating leptin is actually two, twofold higher in men with prostate cancer compared to healthy controls. And men generally will undergo androgen deprivation in prostate cancer. And that causes a further twofold increase in leptin. So yeah, really involved in really trying to come in and find out mechanisms involved in treatment resistance. And so our entire group at the Australian Prostate Cancer Research Center um, are really trying to find ways to prevent treatment resistance because this is the um, ultimate thing that will lead to failure of treatment and death in men with prostate cancer. If you catch prostate cancer early, um, generally men will respond well, but 
typically uh, around 25 to 40% of these men will go on to have um, treatment resistance and failure. And so what I'm interested in is coming in with novel targeted therapies to prevent this progression to increase survival in these men. And so my work is around this adipokine axis. I've just very briefly told you that there's changes in adipokines in the circulating level, but also we know that the receptors are also changed um, at the tumor level. And this can result in a large, um, let's say suite of pathways that can cause tumors to become more aggressive. And so you can see, I've recently published a couple of papers um, on adiponectin, which is also an adipokine and leptin um, coming in with novel targeted therapies to try and prevent prostate cancer progression. And you can see I've just given a little bit of a snapshot of some data. So this is in a mouse model of, um, of androgen sensitive prostate cancer, where if you come in with Aloeca, which is our leptin receptor antagonist, we see a real improvement in um, tumor progression in these animals with doubling time of tumors increased, the tumor volumes decreased, and they actually um, had a lot better extension of survival compared to vehicle control. And so I'm talking today about bone metastatic cancer. So uh, commonly prostate cancer will metastasize to bone. 90% um, of bone uh, of patients with metastatic prostate cancer are um, presenting with um, metastatic bone disease. And just 36% um, of these patients survive past five years. And so it's a really critical um, clinical context that I'm coming in with. And we know a lot about the bone microenvironment in itself. Um, there's been a lot of um, work done on the endosteal and vascular niches and how they are involved in bone metastasis. But there's something that's often ignored, which is bone marrow is mostly made up of adipose tissue. And so I'm really interested in exploring the role of adipokines and adipose tissue in um, the development of tumors within bone um, and really coming in to try and work out whether we have the potential to use some of these novel targeted adipokine therapies um, to come in and prevent tumor progression. So today I'm asking for people who might be interested in working with me in this completely novel project where I aim to determine the impacts of adipokine dysregulation um, in the bone microenvironment and try and work out mechanisms involved in adipokines leading to um, bone metastasis progression with the ultimate goal to try and position some of the therapeutics that I'm working on um, against bone metastasis in clinic. And so what I'm looking for is someone who clearly has more clinical insights than me. So I'm a researcher, very much um, need to lean on that clinical expertise um, to really get an idea of whether my questions are centred in the right area. Um, also access to biopsy tissue, which I know is hard to come by, especially in the metastatic um, patients, uh, but even... Um, uh, normal tissue would be very beneficial to me in answering some of those basic biology questions. And also to establish collaborations, not just for this link, which this would be awesome, but for future and really um, establish some network. And while I'm pitching to you what you could potentially offer me, I have a lot to offer as well. So I have a lot of capabilities in basic and translational science, ranging from obesity to cancer. A lot of the work that I do is very much involved in preclinical modeling. So I do a lot of animal work. So if you're interested in, say for example, prostate cancer models or models in obesity, I'm your person. <laughs> um, so definitely contact me and get involved because it's not just on a uh, preclinical level, but we also do a lot of drug development work and anything ranging from histology through to bioinformatics. So definitely um, chat with me later. So I'd like to thank everyone for the opportunity to pitch to you um, and definitely catch me um, at the networking afterwards. Thank you. I want to work with you just because oh, you pitch. Oh, thank you. <laughs> John, just behind you there. Thanks. 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 Cool. Great. Yep. So do you think your a different kind of target therapy is going to be better as a prevention yeah. of yep. or is it going to be something that's going to come into the future to establish metastasis? Exactly. So out of a kind, uh, so. Once bone um, metastases are formed, um, that whole adipocyte kind of niche will be completely destroyed by 
um, the tumour potentially. And so I'm really interested in that early kind of like what's happening in that, let's say seeding or, or really early progression stage. So that's why I'm like, let's try and see some more basic science behind the mechanisms involved, but also, yeah, really coming in before it's overtaken to try and, with that being said, um, leptin receptors or adipine adiponectin receptors are highly expressed throughout the body and so on the vascular system um, so there are potentials for coming in later and this is really proof of concept to try and work out where we're best placed yeah just over here <laughs> hi lisa phil rail from orthopedics thanks for hi, the talk thanks uh, i just have one question uh it would Logically, it makes sense that perhaps they, it might be, they might be more uh, prevalent in lytic disease, not so much sclerotic bone mm. disease, such as prostate. So mm -hmm. does your uh, study envisage doing more than just prostate Yes. Uh, in terms of the tissue sampling here? Yep. Um, so that's a good point. Um, so I know that um, metastatic samples are very hard to come by. So I'm open to any metastatic sites. <laughs> so if it's anything ranging from breast to lung to prostate, um, definitely open to more. Yeah. You should talk to the orthopedic oh. team, I think. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Okay, so I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Paul Clark, um, a senior staff specialist in gastroenterology, um, as well as the alcohol and drug assessment unit at PA Hospital. And he's gonna talk to us about from alcohol to cirrhosis, applying translational omics platforms to understand how host transcriptional and gut microbiome factors modify liver injury effects of alcohol exposure. Thank you. Thank Could you. I just uh, use this USB instead? Just to... Can. Yeah. can we take this one away? Just to throw a spanner in the works. I'll let you drive it, Alan. Yeah, you drive it, Alan. Thanks for the opportunity to present. Also gives me an opportunity to lower the standard of the PowerPoint presentations you've seen today. Uh, you'll see me in full, full flight of my PowerPoint skills. I, I do have an arrow that turns around. That's about as good as it gets. And we're also at a, a, I have to say, a more greenfield side in terms of our, pardon me, yeah, link draft. That's great. Uh, in terms of our hypothesis generation and our publications uh, in this area. So uh, uh, I'll be doing this work with Andrew Palmer, who's our liver fellow at the PA this year, and um, he's going to be doing a PhD. He's elected for the penury of research as opposed to the penury of colonoscopy, which is a hard decision as a gastroenterologist. Um, but we're gonna try to understand how uh, the, the exposure effect of alcohol can modify the effect on the liver and how that might be uh, modified by behavior as well. So what we're really interested in is the gut liver brain access. So uh, cirrhosis is probably the, the sort of key complication that worries most people who drink too much. But in fact, only sort of 10 to 15% of people who drink in excess actually end up with cirrhosis. And in fact, often people who don't drink very much might end up with liver damage and people who drink a lot don't end up with any liver damage. So really it's not clear the, uh, the cause and effect here is, is definitely, uh, it doesn't always translate as one might expect. The, the sort of key uh, thing that we recognize in liver injury is steatohepatitis. And, and that's indistinguishable largely from metabolic steatohepatitis. Uh, even when we do liver biopsies, we really can't make the distinction. There's a lot of pathways involved. A lot of them uh, involve uh, fatty acids. So uh, we both uh, incite um, fatty acid synthesis directly through acetaldehyde and increased delivery of lipopolysaccharide uh, through the uh, leaky gut wall, which you've heard about through other talks. But we also inhibit fatty acid oxidation uh, and that's largely done through um, altered gene transcription. Um, so this sort of pathway of injury, which we is well recognized in, in, liv in, in liver histology from a, a kind of bland steatosis sometimes, then an inflammatory 
uh, milieu that can, kind of lays down a, a, a cycle of injury and repair, usually favoring the harmful side of repair, which develops fibrosis and eventually leading to nodule, forma nodule formation, which is how we characterize cirrhosis, which in many cases can be complicated by liver cancer. And we know some things already clinically that, that affect modify alcohol exposure and liver injury. And, and some of those are, are related to uh, effects of hormones like estrogen, also the volume of the liver. Women have smaller volumes uh, of liver. We know that women, when they lose the effect of estrogen, actually switch to a sort of more male pattern of risk for liver injury for metabolic liver disease as well. Um, and other things that you might expect might contribute to, to, to liver injury, like other liver diseases, can also be sort of synergistic in the effect of liver, liver injury from alcohol, and also some genetic polymorphisms, which I'll discuss later on. So um, what about this gut liver access? Well, we, we know that um, the gut is directly affected by alcohol. We know that it affects the mucus layer of the gut. We know that um, it's not only the number of bacteria which are overgrown in alcohol exposure, but also the nature of bacteria that change and we get dysbiotic um, population. But also the effect that alcohol has on the tight junctions of the gut uh, and this increase in gut permeability that then leads to increased translocation of um, um, a bacterial lipopolysaccharide. And, um, and we know that lipopolysaccharides are really key uh, mechanism in, in the complications of liver disease. We know that patients with portal hypertension have increased uh, gut permeability, that there's an increased delivery of, of lipopolysaccharide and that, that impacts things like uh, hepatic encephalopathy in the late stages of portal hypertension, but also this delivery of lipopolysaccharide probably has a role to play in the development of fibrosis in alcohol-related liver injury as well. Um, so, and, so this is well characterized, the gut's, the gut's drained by the portal venous circulation, which is delivered to the liver. And then at the level of the sinusoid, which is the sort of microstructure that that allows the, the portal circulation to communicate with liver cells and to circulate through the liver. Um, inflammatory cells of the liver, the Kupfer cells, uh, get upregulated with inflammatory markers that uh, I'm sure other people are better capable to speak of, um, but the inflammatory markers, which then recruit other inflammatory uh, cells, both the adaptive and, uh, and innate immune cells, which upregulate this injury re repair, injury repair cycle. Um, and so this increase in cytokines, liver cytokines, serum cytokines, and increase in the leakiness of the gut becomes a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and we know that the uh, PNPLA3 gene uh, uh, is associated with a higher risk of injury, uh, both fibrosis and liver cancer risk in patients with both metabolic and alcohol-induced uh, liver injury. Patients are more likely to develop cirrhosis and fibrosis uh, after your control for their exposures and their metabolic risks in those two liver diseases. And that the prevalence of the risk allele for this gene, the PMPLA3 gene, uh, is increased in patients with cirrhosis, increased in those who have fatty change uh, compared to unaffected controls. Um, what's interesting and perhaps less well characterized is how the gut microbiome and the permeability of the gut might affect how people feel. Of course, how people feel drives a lot of behaviors in terms of addiction and how people drink and how people drink affects what liver injury got. So, so really separating all these uh, sort of parts of the Venn diagram creates some challenges. This is an interesting study though that gives you a sort of proof of concept and why it probably ended up in the PNAS. Uh, a group of control patients compared to patients with uh, alcohol dependent patients with a, a, a high uh, intestinal permeability compared to patients with low intestinal permeability and controlled for most other factors, including alcohol intake. Um, it was found that this group of patients who were admitted in uh, the alcohol dependent patients in a period of withdrawal for about 19 days uh, and had their intestinal permeability uh, measured with a, a drink, which basically measured the urine output and then calculated intestinal permeability as a result of that, um, found that patients with 
a higher intestinal permeability, had higher baseline scores of depression and anxiety and experienced higher levels of craving. And that at follow-up, uh, patients with greater intestinal permeability had higher residual levels, even in the presence of uh, exclusion of alcohol. And also they looked at the nature of the characteristics of the gut biome and found that they could group different uh, sort of key punters in the, uh, in the gut microbiome like Prosnitsa, which is considered to be a kind of a inflammatory uh, um, bug in the microbiome has been associated with a number of different outcomes. And also that across uh, the, the, both the population of bacteria and the nature of bacteria, things like you know, uh, depression scales, uh, and craving all reduced with the nature and the density of uh, gut dysbiosis. Anyway, so that was uh, that's really where we we start from here. I, I, when I uh, got the invitation, I thought we were throwing the idea out for discussion rather than giving you a hard and um, what we're planning on doing is uh, next you know, uh, generation sequencing on liver tissue pairing liver biopsy. So we, um, by virtue of the fact that we're liver specialists and addiction medicine specialists, we have a a rich cohort of patients with both alcohol dependence and no liver disease, well characterized for their craving and mood by psychologists, and also um, well characterized for liver disease, both using invasive and non-invasive techniques to assess liver disease. And uh, we'll be using liver tissue to do next genome sequencing uh, to try to understand the transcriptome and how that might impact with uh, baseline features of the gut microbiome and characterizing intestinal permeability. And, and trying to associate the sort of moving spheres of craving, mood, uh, liver disease, and the gut microbiome to try to put a bit more uh, data around the gut liver brain excess in alcoholic related liver disease. Thank you. Questions or comments? I, I just want to do one more yeah. thing. I I just have I mean, my oh, piece right to resist. Well, that just made it. There you go. You know. There you go. So, if, so the collaborators that you're missing at the moment, could you speak to that? Yeah, well, um, you can see that steatosis and, and fatty change and um, altered fatty acid uh, oxidation is a big feature. So um, we've sort of reached out at this stage, but we haven't formalized any collaboration looking at some metabolomics to try to better understand some of the sterol pathways uh, that might be implicated in, in that and how we could measure that. One of the sort of clinical challenges is how you might, uh, liver biopsy will be taking liver, we hope to be taking liver biopsies and doing NGS on them, but that's not a kind of technique that we would think would be employable long-term as a clinical tool to try to predict whether a patient with exposure is going to get cirrhosis and how we might be able to do it. So we're very interested in trying to get a biomarker, a simple biomarker like saliva, which is what we're looking at doing um, for um, mass spectrometry to try to get a metabolomic profile on, on a simply easily collected uh, test that's non-invasive um, as a predictor uh, to help prognosticate for patients. Okay. okay. I was just wondering, <laughs> yeah well excel is probably you know as good as it gets for me but uh, um I, I guess the do you mean in terms of looking at the long-term outcomes for of, of the gut microbiome specifically or yeah yeah i just saw in that yeah that study was quite interesting for that that sort of 20-day period and it does show that you get significant reductions in the course of one person over time in, in the sort of richness of the gut microbiome. Um, so I, I think it's hard to adjust for that. I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure how, how we, we're going to go about that to follow them over time in all honesty. I guess what we're hoping to do, and, and this is a, a bit of a hairy area in, um, in alcohol dependence, is lifetime exposures to alcohol. Um, because we've got a cross-sectional cohort that's going to be very well characterized at time point one. And some of those things we're not going to be able to follow up really in terms of prognosticating. Um, I think sometimes maybe agreeing to linkage sort of, you know, in terms of passive follow-up for patients long-termly, agreeing to data linkage and then 
linking them into outcomes like death and readmission due to alcohol related um, cirrhosis related outcomes or dependence and death it's probably the uh, one good way to do it uh, but it's a good thought thanks thank you so much Paul. great thank you oops yep, that's right thank you I don't want to. I don't want to take your calls for gastroenterology. Um, so next up, we have Dr. Von Torres, who's going to uh, research officer within UQDI here at TRI, talking about investigating antibody-mediated exacerbation of gram-negative in infections. We'll just pop out of here, and then we'll get you on. That's right. Awesome. Just testing it. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm Von Torres. I'm a research officer in Timothy Wells' lab. We're based just here at TRI, and we're affiliated with the University of Queensland Diamantian Institute. So to get right into it, um, we're in, uh, interested in antibody functions that directly deal with gram-negative pathogens. So some of these functions include neutralization, phagocytosis, and complemented mediated lysis, uh, more popularly known as serum killing. So just the mouse lab. That's right. Um, so just in the top right is the schematic of complemented media lysis or serum killing. So upon the bacteria entering the host, complement proteins shown in green bind it uh, in the serum. And then this allows the formation of the membrane attack complex. And this is lethal to the bacteria, which causes rapid killing, and this prevents colonization and subsequent infection. So what our lab is interested in is a phenomenon called antibody-dependent enhancement of bacterial disease caused by cloaking antibodies, which actually inhibits this process. So just looking at the bottom right, focusing first on the left is normal uh, complement binding and MAC deposition. So the orange antibodies are able to hit the cell surface of the gram-negative bacteria. This allows the me membrane attack complex to form, and this is lethal and kills the bacteria. And in our phenomenon case is actually the red antibodies are uh, specific to LPS. They create a physical blockade and this is hypothetical, but we believe that the complement is not able to pass this barrier and the membrane attack complex can't um, form and therefore the bacteria doesn't die. So actually um, our lab has actually uh, published cases of using plasmapheresis or plasma exchange therapy to remove these cloaking antibodies. And this was able to um, treat drug resistant infections where conventional therapies weren't able to work originally. So how does this tie in with the research dilemma? So there's the global health concern of antibiotic resistance in gram-negative bacteria. So I, I took this figure from a 2018 Lancet infectious disease paper. Oh, it's slightly shifted, but that's okay. Um, but basically the top five organisms on this priority list is ones that the WHO has said that they need urgent development of new antibiotics. And what I'm just trying to point out is most of these are gram-negatives. So I would challenge this and say, future research should also look into non-antibiotic therapies because this will also curtail um, the rise of um, antibiotic resistance. So then tying that all in together, we just wanna see if there's a seroprevalence or clinical relevance of these cloaking antibodies and establish them in other gram negatives. So I'll touch upon it in the next slide, but we have published papers looking at Pseudomonas aeruginosa and also E. coli. So the proposed racist questions is exactly what I just said for the first one. So what is the seroprevalence and the clinical relevance of these cloaking antibodies? So we have worked with um, lung infections, uh, so pseudomonas aeruginosa and bronchiectasis and cystic fibrosis. We've also looked at a cohort of urosepsis E. coli. So we're looking at other bacteria and other disease presentations. So it's bacteremia, abscesses, complex wounds, anything like that. Um, the other thing that we're interested in because we are a microbiology lab or a bacteriology lab is do these cloaking antibodies correlate with certain pathotypes? So using Klebsiella or E. coli as an example, different pathotypes like classical um, Klebsiella pneumonia or hypervalent Klebsiella pneumonia actually produce different virulence factors. So we just want to see if these cloaking antibody phenotype is specific to those pathotypes. And finally, the last thing that we want to do is look at the glycosylation profiles of these antibodies and use it as a biomarker for infectious diseases, which everyone's been saying about biomarkers. So cloaking antibodies, like other antibodies, have a glycosylation signature on them. And in a previous study, they were um, looking at infection of tuberculosis patients. They were able to show that 
uh, patients that had active tuberculosis versus latent had different glycosylation profiles. So in the same vein, we want to see if cloaking antibodies have a different glycosylation signature compared to healthy patients. So the expected translational outcomes I've boiled down to three, but there could be more. So determine the clinical relevance of cloaking antibodies in other gram-negative pathogens. Um, we want to see if it's a biomarker, as I just previously said, so we could improve diagnostics and treatment of this. And then from this, we want to determine the molecular mechanisms, because that's what our lab does. So we want to understand if there's a shared mechanism in gram-negative. So I can talk about it in a bit more detail, but we have looked at which genes are involved in this, and it's LPS and things like that. And we want to see if it's a contributing role to disease. So we understand in a lot of diseases, there's other factors to consider, like the host site. So we just want to see if we can make a more holistic approach to this. And the final one is we want to promote clinical awareness of cloaking antibodies to improve current therapies and just inform current vaccine efforts as well. So the collaboration details that we're looking at is pretty simple. So we're looking for a clinician that's interested in treating and understanding gram-negative infections. So suggested specialties would be infectious diseases or a pathologist in microbiology or any kind of specialty that has access to patients with gram-negative infections. Um, obviously, we would need help with collecting patient samples that are matched, so bacterial isolates and patient sera, and it would be helpful if we had patient data as well, so any treatments they're on and whatnot. That's it. Questions, comments? I was looking at our CEO, who's also a CF uh, physician, thinking that he might have something to talk about in this space. So I guess, so there's one up there. Thanks, Mayor. I was just wondering, have you thought about looking at um, autoimmune diseases just to see if the autoantibodies have a, a different glycosylation pattern? And do you think that actually cloaking antibodies could potentially be a treatment for autoimmunity? Can you just repeat that, Mahir, with a little bit closer? Sorry, sure. I can't hear it. <laughs> Sorry, uh, have you ever thought about looking at autoimmunity and whether the glycosylation patterns are different in autoimmunity mediated by antibodies? Yeah, compared so to we are currently looking at that. So we're trying to pull it from different disease states and look at um, infection and also autoimmunity kind of diseases. So we've got a collaborator in Griffith where we're pulling different antibodies and seeing what their profiles look like. So that is one of our interests, maybe down the track as well. If the antibodies go away, have you tracked a patient across a time course of an E. coli infection or otherwise? Do they, do they stay? Do they go? What happens to them? Are they in themselves a biomarker of what's <laughs> happening with, uh, with the illness? Yeah, so basically we have some case reports of it. So we've only done it a few times. So it would be good to do more longitudinal studies on this for sure. But to our understanding, once the infection clears, the antibodies drop, but sometimes they come back and the uh, inhibitory or cloaking antibodies come back as well. Okay, maybe that cor correlates with damage related to the disease exactly. in an organ or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, I used to work in a company and we, we generated monoclonal antibodies for anti-cancer treatment. And one particular mouse antibody had a very unusual feature. It actually formed lattice, antibody, antibody lattice. Uh, depending on the concentration, and it was kind, kind of linked uh, by its um, focusylation silic acid profile. So I'm just wondering, you know, I guess this could be, this certainly was a concentration issue. Yeah. Um, so how much, and then you might have cell seeding effects. And if you maybe wipe off a certain fucose or sil acid, you might, you might dissolve this thing, uh, this, this lattice very easily, you know. Yeah, definitely. So thank you for that. Yeah, so we've definitely work, working out the mechanism still at this point, but titers and, and affinity is super important. The lattice thing is very interesting. I haven't seen anything like that, but that could provide a model for what's happening with the barrier. Thank you. That would be great. So I'm going to take a so I have two questions. One is, um, I think this is more of an issue for chronic infection versus acute brain 
Um, so currently our lab, we do have some bacteremia samples. So we are trying to delineate if it is acute or chronic. So my answer is we don't know, but we're trying to find out. No. <laughs> Different cell wall. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, and our final presenter this afternoon is Dr. Timothy Edwards, psychiatry registrar within Metro South Addiction and Mental Health, and he's going to speak on reward learning as a potential mechanism for improvement following cognitive remediation. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, there we are. Um, and thank you very much to the organisers. So far, this showcase has been just terrific. The research has been fascinating and interesting and the last seven speakers are a very difficult act to follow but you know it's my pleasure to be the final speaker at least of the night from the from the uh the the sales pitches um and i'm going to be talking about cognitive remediation in schizophrenia so as helen mentioned my name is tim edwards i'm a psychiatry registrar i work predominantly at pa hospital and before working at pa hospital i actually did my phd just across the river um, at the queensland brain institute um, so I work mostly in the mental health building, which is just across the road, but to put it in more important terms, it's equidistant between the coffee shop here um, and the coffee shop in the main hospital. So bear that in mind when choosing a collaborator. I think that makes us an ideal collaborator because we don't mind where we get our coffee. So who are we looking for? Um, so we are looking for early and mid-career researchers. We are looking for people with expertise in functional and diffusion neuroimaging, Prefer preferentially um, a background in computational neuroscience and a background, or if nothing else, just an interest in psychosis and um, schizophrenia research. So what is our study about? Well, our study is about schizophrenia and, you know, in the public imagination, schizophrenia um, exists as a cluster of what we would define as positive symptoms. So things like hallucinations, bizarre beliefs, delusions, these sorts of things are what capture the public imagination, what most people think of when they think of schizophrenia. But actually there's a whole other cluster of symptoms that we term negative symptoms, which are hugely impactful in our patients' lives and are importantly very difficult to treat with current antipsychotic treatments. So if I can use this mouse, because I can, point to these online. So things like affective flattening, alogia, avolition, anhedonia, um, cognitive symptoms, def deficits in memory uh, and executive functions are things that have enormous impacts on the daily lives of our patients with schizophrenia, um, especially once they uh, recover from their positive symptoms and leave the inpatient environment. And importantly as well, the course of cognitive impairment in schizophrenia is protracted. Um, and chronic and stable. So you can see here in this graph, you know, positive symptoms, these hallucinations and psychotic symptoms are, you know, uh, very severe initially, but we can treat those relatively effectively with antipsychotic medications. Whereas these more pernicious negative symptoms and cognitive deficits uh, persist even uh, in longer term with effective antipsychotic therapy. And they're broad ranging as well. And you won't be able to appreciate that from the, uh, terrible formatting of the graph, but essentially what, what this is trying to show is that, you know, there's, there's a broad range of deficits in terms of, you know, speed of thinking, memory attention, reasoning, social cognition, and uh, synthesis as well. And when we compare schizophrenia to other mental illnesses as well, these deficits are very severe. So you can see here a number of illnesses that we work with in mental health, schizophrenia being down the bottom and these asterisks indicating the severity of symptoms. And you can see that, you know, schizophrenia scores across the board uh, very severely across these social deficits, uh, broad cognitive and social deficits as well. So what do we do about the negative symptoms? Well, the only evidence-based treatment uh, so far for, for the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, and in particular the cognitive symptoms, is cognitive remediation. So what is cognitive remediation? It's an intervention targeting cognitive deficit using scientific principles of learning with the ultimate goal of improving functional outcomes. Its effectiveness is enhanced when provided in a context, formal or informal, that provides support and opportunity for extending everyday functioning. 
Okay, so there you go. That's the, the very brief skinny of it. And is it effective? Well, yes, it is. So here's a meta-analysis done in 2011. So you can see here the forest plot. So anything on the left is a sad face. Anything on the right is a happy face indicating a positive effect of cognitive, remedia cognitive remediation. And you can see in general, there is um, a, a moderate effect in the happy column um, for cognitive remediation in schizophrenia, an effect size of about, about 0.45 um, in this meta-analysis of just shy of 2000 participants. Uh, a more recent meta-analysis uh, looking at more symptoms showed, you know, still a positive effect size, but perhaps a more mild positive effect. And so this really motivates us to uh, try and identify how cognitive remediation works with the intention of improving its efficacy as the only evidence-based treatment for cognitive deficits in schizophrenia. So I preempted the research question, which is that the mechanisms by which cognitive remediation is effective in schizophrenia are currently incompletely understood. So a core component of cognitive remediation therapy is strategic learning principles. So part of the therapy is ensuring the tasks that we present to our consumers are scaffolded based on previous successful achievement. Um, and we also know that in schizophrenia, one of the negative symptoms is a deficit in reward anticipation and representation. This in turn leads to poorer decision-making, motivational deficits and other negative symptoms. So we hypothesize that a potential mechanism for, effects, for the effect of cognitive remediation um, is strengthening of the reward learning pathways in the brain and that this presents uh, a novel potential therapeutic avenue to improve cognition and the motivational negative symptoms. So how will we investigate this? We are going to start off with a very small pilot study of 20 individuals uh, diagnosed with a schizophrenia um, illness. And we are going to perform a number of tasks, social incentive delay and monetary incentive delay, which are well-validated val measures of um, reward learning and pair this with functional MRI and diffusional MRI, diffusion MRI um, to investigate whether reward learning circuitry is altered um, by cognitive remediation. We hypothesize that participants will demonstrate deficits uh, in the degree of the anticipated reward um, at baseline and that this will improve post uh, the cognitive remediation intervention, which is delivered by a computer over 12 weeks. Now I do realize that I didn't put my contact details on my presentation in my haste to complete the slides at the last minute. So in the interest of the earlier analogy um, with speed dating, please come up to me after the event. I'll give you my email, I'll give you my mobile number um, and let's get a coffee. Thanks very much. Thank you. So I believe your details are in the program as well. Oh, okay. So don't worry. Well, you can still come and talk to me. Yeah, please do. Um, questions or comments? So is there capacity for I'm going to say the term word biomarker again outside of neuro <laughs> outside of neuroimaging that you've thought about. Look, I mean, biomarkers have been, um, you know, historically a very tantalizing thing in mental illness, but not necessarily one that has reached much fruition. Mm -hmm. um, so look, I mean, I, that's a good question. I'm not sure is the answer, but certainly neuroimaging is something that we're very interested in, but I guess other biomarkers, things like behavioral biomarkers would be something as well that we'd be really interested in exploring. So if anyone has any experience with that, love to hear from you. Okay. Thank you, Tim. That's fantastic. Thank you. All right. That's our, so rounding off the presentations tonight, we've got two final talks from a further two exemplars. So I'd like you to welcome um, Kate Irvine, who's a senior research fellow and a career track fellow at MATA Research, who's working in the macrophage um, biology research group. Hopefully yours will be there. Thank you. It's an honour to be invited as, a, as an exemplar. I've been asked to talk about um, my experience um, in clinical collaboration. Uh, so this is a brief uh, pre uh, presented, I'm not used to that. A brief timeline here of my postdoctoral career, just so you can see where I've come from. I think I was always interested in translational research, uh, but my first exposure to clinical research was when I did a postdoc with uh, Regeni Thomas at UQDI, which mo uh, who most of you will know. That was a really great experience in a well-integrated clinical and basic research lab. Helen was there at the time, actually. Um, but what I want to talk to you about today is a collaboration that started in 2012 when I joined Professor Elizabeth Powell at the... Um, 
UQ at the UQ School of Medicine and uh, and I was there for about five years until 2017. Oh, sorry, I haven't got my slide up. I'm looking at it myself. Um, until 2017, when I took a new role, uh, setting up a, a lab with David Hume in Marta Research when he came back from Edinburgh. But this is a really faint dividing line for a reason, and that's because we continue to collaborate and she remains one of my um, closest collaborators and uh, most important collaborators and mentors and also a dear friend. So this was our group circa 2015. This is Elizabeth. She's also in the audience up the back there. Uh, this is Lee Horsfall, a research nurse who worked with us for many years until she retired to Tasmania last year. It's where research pushes you. Dr. Kevin Fagan, who was a clinical fellow at the time. Um, postdoc Mel Michelle Molino and Dr. Victoria Gadd, um, uh, who was a PhD student at the time. So um, I want to highlight these um, sort of clinical fellow and the research nurse, because these are really critical linking positions, I think, for successful research, especially for an ongoing collaboration. In addition to their medical skills, they, they're the people who can find patients for you, consent patients for you, collect clinical data, collect samples and all kinds of things, and they're really essential. So Elizabeth is a hepatologist who also trained as a, as a bench science and a bench scientist. Um, and she's got a really outstanding uh, track record in across the spectrum of basic and clinical research. Um, there's many models of clinical basic science uh, collaboration, but Elizabeth really um, ran her group at the time as a, as a partnership model, which had really fantastic benefits for me. So in terms of what we have, um, this made me reflect on what we've achieved. And so far we've published, uh, co-authored over 40 publications. We've had some grant success, like everyone. We've also struggled for funding at times. We've formally and informally um, supervised and trained many um, scientists and also junior doctors and medical students. But there've been way more tangible outcomes than this. And for me, that's been a huge gain, gain in knowledge um, and also mentorship. Um, I think one of the best things a mentor can do for you is to really introduce you to people and expand your network and champion you. And Elizabeth has certainly done that for me. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, I think scientists do bring different approaches and tools and our projects have and trainees have benefited from that. So obviously we work in chronic liver disease um, and just very uh, briefly, um, Many forms of injury can lead to progressive fibrosis um, and cirrhosis and um, one of the fastest emerging forms of cancer, which is uh, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. And there's many clinical, many clinical needs across this spectrum from needing to understand mechanisms pro of progression because there's no drugs to prevent or treat uh, fibrosis. Uh, we need better biomarkers uh, to identify disease earlier and strat risk stratify patients. And these are really complex um, patients to manage uh, because they have many comorbidities and other life challenges. So we've done a lot of research across this whole spectrum. I don't expect you to take in details, but we've used uh, patient um, samples and, and preclinical models to investigate mechani uh, mechanisms of progression. We've looked at uh, evaluated clinically available biomarkers and also done biomarker discovery work. And we also initiated a, a whole new uh, research area which uh, around immune function in patients with cirrhosis because infections are a, a huge um, life-threatening problem in this population. And it was actually a good example of something that was raised as a clinical need by Elizabeth and that we together kind of had complementary skills to tackle. So obviously, um, I'm not involved in... Um, uh, driving projects at the the kind of patient management models of care end of things, but I've had the con uh, the, um, the the privilege to contribute to a number of studies in this area, which has really expanded my um, field of view. And so all of this has involved an army of collaborators, really many of them locally here at the PA hospital. Um, I'm sorry, I haven't named everyone who's involved. Um, was uh, maybe because one of the questions that Julia asked me to answer was how, and I think the simple, honest answer is, well, we just phoned them up. We had really strong willingness and interest of people to be involved. Um, and you might, especially the scientists among you, might be wondering, uh, did Elizabeth phone you or did I phone them? A little bit of both actually, but even, and, and that clinician, clinician initial contact is, um, you know, probably has, a, has an advantage, a strategic advantage, but, you know, there's a whole world of, 
of actually building the relationship that happens after that initial contact, which you can be involved in. So I don't really have a recipe for success. Um, sometimes I think it just comes down to sheer will and resilience. Um, maybe I'm doing it wrong. Um, I, for, for me, it's been a pleasure to have this continuing collaboration model, which is very rewarding. Um, diversity has been great, having lots of projects and uh, different um, avenues of funding for that, but it's also challenging because well, many projects is very challenging. But all these things kind of grow organically and one size doesn't fit all. So for anyone thinking about um, collaborating with a clinician, for one thing, I would suggest that you watch the Director's Choice Seminar from last week, where there are a couple of excellent presentations from uh, clinician and scientists that really went into this in much more detail. But I'd say be specific about what you want to need, find a clinician with aligned skills and interests and um, a kind of matched desired level of engagement, ask questions, try and learn their language. You really need to learn about hospital and clinic workflows and procedures if you've got any hope of collecting samples from patients. And if you are um, coming up with sample collection protocols, um, you really need to remain visible once you start and take advantage of momentum that you have because it really needs to become a kind of a routine thing. People won't continue to phone you if you say, oh, no, not today, thank you. Um, and from our point of view, you really need to follow through and give back, um, be receptive to clinicians' ideas and needs of what they think clinical research projects, um, clinical um, questions to answer, do as much of the groundwork as you can, do a, write the grant, write the ethics. And if you need input, be really specific about what it is that you need. Budget appropriately. Um, these, as I mentioned, these uh, linking, clinical linking roles are, are really crucial. Um, share the outcomes of the research with people that you've, who've helped you along the way. And don't be shy to ask questions and explore lots of possibilities. They might not get off the, all of them might not get off the ground, but um, we all know that time and money are universal enemies, but I've found no scarcity of curiosity and goodwill. So thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to our team collaborators. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Kate. Such a great example of a deep and meaningful and long-standing collaboration between researchers and clinicians. And lastly, we've got, hopefully, we've got Elizabeth, who should also be online. Yes, here I am. I just need to share my screen. Yep, you're right to share, Elizabeth. Hopefully, it'll come up. Here we go. Is that there for you? So I'm going to tell you the tale of urologic oncologist Ian Bella and myself. Uh, Ian couldn't be here tonight because he's actually in surgery operating. But otherwise, so you're going to get my skewed view of our partnership. Ian and I actually now co-run our labs together. And in some ways, this was a fortunate coincidence. For a while, we were on opposite sides of the world. Ian was doing a fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre. And I was running a cancer metastasis lab at Monash um, Institute of Medical Research at Monash Medical Center. And then we both got a call. There we go. To join the Australian Prostate Cancer Research Center Queensland, which was fantastic. And this happened at about the same time for us. Now, Ian and I still didn't really know each other very well at APCSEQ. We were both doing our prostate cancer research work, and Ian was a busy um, uro urological surgeon. But one day, we ended up in a taxi together, moving from a conference to a conference dinner and just randomly were next to each other. And we've been talking about prostate cancer all day. But I said to Ian, one of the things that really frustrates me is how bladder cancer is never talked about at anything. And so he said, it's really been annoying for me too. And I said, yeah, I publish a paper every, you know, once every three years on it on the smell of an oily rag. I've searched the NHMRC then called Project Grants Files. They funded one bladder cancer project in 10 years and it wasn't basic research, it was a clinical trial. Now bladder cancer is really an unmet clinical need. So this five year survival rate for bladder cancer is just over 50% and really hasn't moved. It's one of the few cancers that we haven't improved upon over the last decade or so. So clearly something that we both were passionate about and something that we both would like to do something about. So we nutted out, 
what we would like to do there. And we decided that the way to do that, because we didn't have any funding for it, was to bring as many people as we could together and we needed an umbrella organisation for that. So we founded the Queensland Bladder Cancer Initiative. And under that guise, we were able to get, attract some grant funding from the PA Hospital Research Foundation in the first instance, which was absolutely critical to getting it off the ground. And we based our whole program around precision medicine. For us, this was the key thing. We wanted to be able to diagnose people better. We wanted to follow them up in a less invasive way. And we wanted to understand what the biology of, of bladder cancer was, because there could be improvement in treatments. And so the, the end game, of course, many years down the track still is to improve those outcomes. As part of our program, though, we thought there were some really simple steps that we could take. So at the Pear Hospital, we didn't have a bladder cancer multidisciplinary team meeting, and now we have one. This has been really effective. We also set up a bunch of clinical trials, which Ian led, which are mostly phase three, but as the occasional investigator led one in there. And we really set out to make sure that we were training a pool of people who would be able to continue to carry the flag for bladder cancer and, and, attack, and attack the research problem. And so important for us was that this was both scientists and clinicians, which has had a terrific um, flow and effect in the lab, because in the lab we have bring together now people with all different experience. We have the, the clinicians who've done their medical degrees, we have biomedical sciences trained people and we have the medical laboratory scientists trained people. And those backgrounds really mean that all of those people collaborate already within the group and take those skills and collaboration outside. So I think one of the things that really made it easy for Ian and I to get this moving was not only did we share the passion, but we also had the benefit of a shared language Ian had done a PhD in um, laboratory-based PhD in molecular biology. His was actually in prostate cancer. I had been attending and, and contributing to uh, urology multidisciplinary team meetings for over 20 years. At each um, institution where I've had my research group, I've always been on a hospital campus and I've always been in the multidisciplinary team meeting. So this was really useful. We understood where each other was coming from. We respected where each other was coming from. When we knew we had an expert by our side and that together we would be able to bring our different backgrounds and our different expertise together. And so when we work in the lab, what we're really looking across is the spectrum of, of issues that face somebody diagnosed with prostate cancer. And this has let us bring our patient very proximal, our, our research study very proximal to the patient. So we are consenting patients and collecting tumor tissue, blood samples, urine samples, and we do it in a longitudinal way because bladder cancer often presents like that with multiple recurrences. And we use those samples to ask basic biology questions as well as try and understand for that individual person, can we predict what might be the course of their disease and what might be the best treatment for them, which is very exciting. The other thing that we have been keen about is raising the profile of bladder cancer generally. So the Victorian Cancer Council coined the term for bladder cancer, the forgotten cancer. It bumps around at about the 10th most common cancer with a few of the others down there. And it's four times more common in men than women, which might also explain why it doesn't have much airtime. You blokes are not always very good about talking about your health. And so to do that, we've been very engaged with consumers and the community. And with the help of the PA Research Foundation, every year we organise to do things like um, light up the bridges around Brisbane. So this is this year's um, Story Bridge lights, the colours of the bladder cancer ribbon. And we've had things like a bladder cancer fundraising art show where we can bring people from outside the community in, talk about bladder cancer, as well as running uh, sessions where we can have people who've been diagnosed with bladder cancer and their family and carers come along and understand and ask us questions about what we're doing and talk about what are their issues. This has led to an international profile, which has meant that people now approach us to be engaged with um, their research and in big multinational um, studies where we can contribute, leading, really leading the way for Australia as we're the, by far the biggest uh, bladder cancer group there. In the meantime, we're both still doing our prostate cancer research, but that tends to be a little bit more divergent than our bladder cancer research is, which we're mostly doing together, but there's space for both of those things. 
And as I said, it, you know, we still don't have buckets of money for this, which we would really like to have, but with the help of the PA Research Foundation and then the CPAC grant that we talked about at the beginning of the session, we've really been able to push the precision medicine program forward. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, that ends the formal part of the Link Showcase. I hope you've enjoyed the presentations and been inspired um, to form some collaborators and to submit a Link grant or to have a think about that because they open tomorrow and they close on the 1st of November. Before we go out to the atrium for some drinks and some um, food, I'd like to ask you to join me in giving a final round of applause for all the presenters today, as well as Metro South and MARTA for collaborating with TRI on the LINK program. And I just would like to especially thank Metro South for all the help in developing the program over the last 18 months, and in particular, Enna Stroll Slama, who's here in the audience, Paul de Alba, and um, Lisa Kaslich for all of their background work over a period of time. So thank you. Um, if I could just ask all the presenters to remain just for a group photo, everyone else is free to go and have some drink and some food. Thank you.